This week we are studying morphemes, which are minimal units of meaning. For example, the word birds has two morphemes in it. One of them is bird, which tells you the kind of creature it is. The other morpheme is the plural, which shows up as an S, and it tells you that there's many birds. All these words have plurals, birds, foxes, and dogs. However, the plural shows up in more than one way. Here it shows up as a single letter, and here it shows up as two different letters. So we have one morpheme that has more than one surface form. We have a morpheme that has several allomorphs. Let's jump right into it. English has a morpheme for the plural and a bound inflectional morpheme. And it is written with the letter S, as in cats, maps, and rocks. So we have these. But the plural doesn't always appear in the same way. If we look at the phonetic transcription of the words, you can see that sometimes the plural shows up as an S, like in cats, maps, rocks, and cliffs. And sometimes it's a Z, as in birds, dogs, crowns, and Americas. And by the way, if you have trouble, uh, if you want to verify, you can put your hand against your hand against your throat and say dogs, dogs, and feel that there is vibration. It really is a Z. We also have words where the plural shows up as is, as in bosses, roses, and masses. So there's three different allomorphs for the plural. We are going to do the same thing we did with phonology. If we have three alternatives for the morpheme, we're going to try to get the environments where we see each of them and try to figure out what the pattern is. So for the S in number one, we can see that the morpheme S is preceded by a T and followed by the edge of the word. In number two, the allomorph Z is preceded by a T and followed by the edge of the word. In number three, we can see that the morpheme is is, the allomorph, I'm sorry, is is. It is preceded by an S and followed by the edge of the word. So please go through all of the examples and try to get the environments for each of these allomorphs. Please pause the video. Welcome back. So you should have something like this. Uh, the S appears in examples one, four, seven, and 10, surrounded by consonants like P, K, and F, and always uh, with the edge of the word to its right. The Z allomorph appears next to D, G, N, and the schwa in America, and it is always followed by the edge of the word. Is is preceded by S, Z, and S, and always followed by the edge of the word. So, um, they look like they're in complementary distribution, like they're always followed by the same thing, but they're preceded by very different things. For example, is is always preceded by S and Z, and you cannot find either sound for the other allomorphs. Likewise, the S is always preceded by T, P, K, F, and you cannot find these preceding the other allomorphs. Finally, Z is preceded by sounds like D, G, N, and schwa, which are not found preceding the other ones. So these are in complementary distribution. What do we do? So probably the, the part on the right is not the one that's conditioning the appearance of an allomorph because they all have the same environment to the right. However, they have very different environments to the left. Please try to figure out what the pattern is that uh, joins these sounds together. Is there a feature that all of these sounds share? Is there a feature that these sounds share, or maybe more than one feature? Are there characteristics that these sounds share? Go ahead and give it a shot. Please pause the video. Although these are voiceless, they're stops and fricatives, but they are all voiceless stops and fricatives. Likewise with these, there's really only two of them. They're the two alveolar fricatives, uh, voiceless and voiced. And for Z, we have a slightly more general environment. It can be preceded by consonants, like, by stops like D and G, by nasals like N, 
and even by vowels like schwa. So this one has the more varied environments. And these two are fairly easy to describe using features. Like S is always preceded by voiceless sounds and is is always preceded by alveolar fricatives. So let's make a rule, just like we did with phonology. We could have Z as the base form because it has the greater variety of environments. And then the morphine Z is manifested as the, um, as the phoneme S whenever the morpheme is preceded by a voiceless consonant. So if you have cat and then the plural, the plural needs to appear as the voiceless S. And you can feel it. Say cats. There's no vibration. Cats. Likewise, the morpheme for the plural appears as is whenever it is preceded by a consonant that is alveolar and fricative, like the one in boss. Boss has an S, which is alveolar fricative, and then if you want the plural, the plural needs to appear as is. Finally, we have the that this morpheme appears as Z everywhere else. So if you have a voiced consonant or a vowel, for example, then you get this allomorph. These three are allomorphs of this morpheme, which is the plural in English. And this would be a morphophonological rule. It's a morphology rule that also involves phonological information. So the two levels are combining there to tell us how to do the plural in English. Let's look at another example from English, the past tense. So these verbs are in the past tense, reached, ripped, laughed, camped, and missed. And here, the allomorph of the past tense always shows up as a T, reached, ripped, laughed, camped, missed. Here we have an allomorph of the past tense that is always a D, mowed, blared, loved, failed, and blazed. Finally, we have an allomorph of the past tense that it always shows up as id, as in ratted, rotted, prodded, busted, crafted, and ratted. So take a moment to look at the data and try to come up with a hypothesis for why um, sometimes we see a T as the allomorph T, sometimes we see the allomorph D, and sometimes we see the allomorph id. Please pause the video. Ah, I was one ahead. So the past tense does have these three allomorphs, T, D, and id. The pattern is probably something like this. You have the past tense as T if the root of the verb ends in a voiceless consonant, like the Africa ch in reach, rip, laugh, camp, and miss. If you have a voiceless consonant as the, as the end of the root, then you need the T. If you have a voiced consonant, like in blare, love, fail, and blaze, you need the D. You also need the D if you have a vowel, which is voiced, such as O in moat. Finally, if your root ends in a T or a D, you need id, as in rotted. The rule would be something like this. Uh, we could select the D as the more general rule because it, it has more varied environments. It comes next to vowels and consonants. So this is going to be our base form. And the D, which is the past tense, transforms into a T whenever it is preceded by a a voiceless consonant like the T in uh, I'm sorry like the S in mist the past tense becomes id whenever the the morpheme is preceded by an alveolar stop like in craft and the morpheme for the past tense shows up as D everywhere else that's what that little dot means so these three would be the allomorphs of the English past tense you're going to notice that there are a lot of morphological rules and different allomorphs in English. I'm just going to uh, show you this example of a derivational morpheme, which is in, which uh, changes the meaning of the word to kind of their opposite. Go, uh, you take sensitive and add in, and you have insensitive. Congruous, incongruous. Passable, impassable. This morpheme assimilates 
to the, to the place of articulation of the following consonant. So the morpheme shows up as a velar N if it is next one to an alveolar sound, like the S. It is a velar engma next to a velar K. And it is a bilabial M next to a bilabial P. So there is an assimilation process in the expression of these allomorphs. In summary, morphemes can have allomorphs, which are conditioned by phonological environments, like being next to a voiced or voiceless sound. And we can describe the distribution with morphological rules that look a lot like our phonological rules from last week. In the next video, we're going to study the Turkish plurals and their distribution.